from Title On Air. Welcome to I'm in the Band. I'm your host, Allison Wolf. I can see what you're trying to say to me if I don't explain it away. I'm in the band and I deserve to be here and I do anyway. Oh. Ooh, this time we have Palm Olive. She played drums in not one, but two of my favorite bands, The Slits and The Raincoats. One of her earliest bands was Flowers of Romance with Sid Vicious before he joined the Sex Pistols. As you'll find out, it was his creepiness that inspired Palm Olive to start an all-girl band, The Slits. After getting the boot from The Slits, Palm Olive never played with them again. But she got together recently with the raincoats at the kitchen in New York to play some shows. Watching them practice made me remember my time in a Slits tribute band and how Palmolive's drumming style is really hard to duplicate. I got to interview her that weekend. My name is Paloma Romero Blanco Rizo Fernandez Rubio Estevez Tiegesecal, Aka Palmolive. Unfortunately, it wasn't the quietest of places. But I asked Palmolive what it was like relearning the songs of the Raincoat's first album. When I played the other night, you know, so a week ago in my basement, I have a drum set and I said, oh, I'm going to do this with the Raincoat's. I can do it, so I started listening to myself. I'm going, what the heck am I doing? I'm listening to myself, and it was kind of hard, but then once I got it, it really actually wasn't too hard of a beat. When I encountered the drums, I'm like, you know, they were teaching me how to do the hi-hat, mm cha mm cha cha mm cha And then I'm like, oh, this sounds really cool. I see it like a little kid's painting. You know, a little kid is not inhibited by rules too much at the beginning. And so that you give them paint and they go like, put these amazing colors together and it's beautiful. And it's, uh, I had to deal with the criticism, you're not good, you guys stink, you don't, you're not musician, blah, 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 and you're selling yourself out. And so we, no, no, we're enjoying this. This is alive in me right now and I'm having fun that I can do it and I'm like sharing it with other people and they like it, so I'm gonna keep doing it even if you don't think it's good. Okay, so I was born in Melilla, which is Africa, but belongs to Spain, so I'm African. But I grew up in Malaga, it's a very beautiful, warm place in the south of Spain. I came from a big family of nine brothers and sisters. I was number eight. Um, we were very wild and crazy, and as the numbers went down, we got more and more wild. And uh, what I remember growing up, it was a lot of um, conversations in the kitchen about life, what life is about, what is important, why are we here? Very philosophical um, about justice. Spain at the time was under the dictatorship of Franco, which he lasted like 40 years. And people here in America don't realize really what living under a dictatorship is, you know, you complain about someone being obnoxious. Well, you had someone being obnoxious and that was the law too. I remember being, coming from a school and seeing these hippies coming with the backpacks and, and going to Morocco. And I was just thinking, that is so cool. Like, I want to do that. So then I decided that I wanted to go to London and in London to me represented freedom. I really didn't know anybody. I borrowed $100 from or someone gave me 100 pounds or something. You needed 100 pounds to cross the customs. Right when I got through, I sent them to my friend so he could come. So I was in London, didn't know anybody. 
I didn't understand the language. People say, how are you? And I'm like, oh my God, what the heck are they saying? Uh, I had an address of someone, so I went to their house and I said, I'm friends of so-and-so. Can you please help me find a job? And they were shocked. <laughs> I spent two days with them and I got a job in Piccadilly Circus doing dishes or something, and I was so excited. Eventually, um, I landed in the squats. Uh, my sister Esperanza had, in between, gone. So we crossed paths, but through her, I met Richard Dudansky, who played with the raincoats. So he found me a spot in 101, where George Trauma was living. And so soon after, we became boyfriend and girlfriend, and we were hanging out, and he was very fun, charismatic, and very light-hearted, and I like that. So the whole thing, imagine, like, this girl comes from this very repressive, you don't do anything, you dress a certain way, you do everything but as a woman, what you're supposed to do. You know, I remember, like, fighting my mom, why do I have to do the sandwiches for my brothers. They can do it themselves. Why should I do it? Why can't they come home later than me? You know, it just seems like all those things were fights. So suddenly I'm on my own, really making my own life, writing home and saying, Mama, I'm in um, commune. I am so excited. She actually came. I have to give her credit. She came, and they looked around. I took her outside. There was a toilet outside. That was the only toilet. And I would just listen, and I would be fascinated. Everybody would just, I don't know, we lived on tea and not much. Once a week, a fish and chips or something. I don't know even what we ate, and we had no money, but we felt so blessed and so, like, wealthy and lucky to be there. And the one of one was happening, and that was a big thing. Can you explain just really briefly who the one of ers were? So, um, Woody, who later became Joyce Trama of the Clash. When I met him, he was into, you know, rhythm and blues and all that, and Richard Dudansky from the Raincoat. So they were practicing in the basement, which I thought was really cool, you know. And they just were a bunch of uh, guys, all of them, and there was nobody, none of the girls were playing at that time. I wasn't thinking about playing at all. So, so they were practicing in the basement and they go, we all helped to make a gig, the first gig, and we were all like writing flyers or posting flyers around, and you know, everything that we did, it was like a community effort. So the one on one is really, were built a lot around the support of the community. So then what made you start thinking that you could play music or that you could start a band? A lot of the things that have ha happened in my life had just happened, and then I just jumped to it. So after a while, it wasn't so fun, and I got tired of just, it was a dope. You know, it was just starting to get old, and I get anxious when I, something is, I'm not liking it. I just get, ah, I'm just leaving. <laughs> so then I decided, no, I want to be with Joe. I just need to do something myself. So I thought, I wanted to be a street artist. I wanted to do mime, and I wanted to just be in contact with people. That's what I wanted to do. So I knew this friend, Big John, who had been in the 101ers, the sax player, and he had a group, and they were already doing it. I said, can I join your group? And so he said, sure. So I had to start juggling to get myself in the mood and get the skills and so forth. And so I got there, and there was this Belgian guy who thought it was Francisco Franco Bamontes the second because he was such a like tyrant, and he had a girlfriend, and he said, "Do this and do that." And I'm like, "What?" So I lasted three days, but in those three days, they had said, "Well, we don't need someone to do mime; we need someone to play the drums." So I picked the drums to do the roles while the girl, his girlfriend did the splits, whatever he told her to do. So I go that kind of thing. And, but obviously that didn't last. But I touched the drums. 
So that's how it happened. So it wasn't a conscious decision. I loved dancing. And so when everything was happening and everybody was doing a band, I loved dancing. And to me, like, the drums were more like dancing. So I felt more connected. I never felt like melody was a strong skill that I had or anything. You know, so I felt more like rhythm was my thing. So I got drawn to it. The scene was very small. So the Clash and the Sex Pistols were just one small group. How did you actually get into a, a band? Um, so somehow, I don't really remember, but I was asked to be in the band with Sid Vicious. So I started being in the Flowers of Romance. We were practicing in my house, in the squat, and... Vivian was in a, a girl called Sarah. I think we practiced twice or something like that. So I'm going and meeting up with Sid and these other girls that I don't know, and we're practicing, and then I'm done with practice, and I want to be left alone. And there's Sid Vicious there, and the other girls have gone, and he's there, and he's going, like, really coming on to me in a punkish prince kind of way, you know, kicking the cat and looking rough and... It's so tough. And he said to me, I hate blacks. And I looked at him and I say, I hate people that hate blacks. So of course the conversation wasn't going very far, but he still didn't leave. And in my mind, it's like, just go, just go. I didn't find him sexy. I didn't find him attractive. And, and I wanted my space, but I didn't say get out. Of, you know, like it was also, he was Sid Vicious. It was like, I'm trying to be in this thing. And I was young and I didn't know what to do. And next time we had the band practice, he says, you're out. And I go, what do you mean I'm out? He goes, you're just not right. And I say, okay, you need to leave. You're not practicing here anymore. <laughs> See you later. Wow. Yeah. So, it's like so it doesn't seem very different to Fox News or anything that's going on today, does it? So then with that anger and everything... Where did that take you as far as music after that? I had already started thinking I want to make a band. And so I'm not going to stop now. I'm, and now I'm not getting along with Joe neither. All my friends that I knew are against what we're doing. So it was a rough place reeling away. But I'm determined. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it with girls because I don't want to deal with that. And so I went to a Patti Smith gig. I saw Ari, and she's like on the floor fighting with her mom, you blippity, like whatever. Like she's like cursing her, being a jerk to her, really. But she was 14 on the floor. Everybody's looking at her, and I'm going, wow, she really has no inhibitions. You know, I thought that would be great for the band. And she looked at me, and apparently I had a pig hanging from my ear, like a little piglet, plastic pig, and she liked that. And so I went up to her and I said, would you like to be in a band with me? And she loved the idea. Then we looked for someone to play the bass, Susie Gatsi, who was with us for a very short time. I don't know how many times we practiced, but anyway, so we were on the paper. The three of us, Susie, Ari, and me, it was a tabloid paper. They have sex in their minds and holes in their socks or whatever. Like, it was like an, I am like pointing a gun. Like, you know, it was just like, we hadn't played. We had no play. You hadn't played yet? No. I mean, when they, they were talking because it was a, a social phenomenon. Like these, suddenly all these young kids were looking punkish and what is that? And it was very sensational. They wouldn't say our name because it was too bad of a name to say in a family newspaper, which I doubt it was a family newspaper. But, and then they had the runaways. And then the castrators. And what was the name of the band? The name of the band, the infamous name that couldn't be said, it was The Slits. Cool. Did you come up with that name? No, I didn't. Kate Chorus came up with it. And what bands was Kate Chorus in? The Modettes? Yeah. Uh, 
so we thought it was great because it had lots of meanings and we liked that. It had lots of layers. So we told Susie Gatsy she couldn't be in the group um, and then we had seen an ad in the same newspaper the castrators were and um, we thought we'll just take Tessa from the castrators, you know. So we talked to her and she joined us and then so it was Kay, Chorus, Tessa and Ari and me. I felt like the way we treated Kay wasn't right and then Vivian wanted to be part of it. At the beginning she didn't want to be. But then when she saw what was happening, now we were going, oh, now she wants to be with us, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> so we, we told Kate to go. And I thought, you know, I don't want her just to go. Like, I, you know, I thought, you want to be our manager? And she said, no, of course. <laughs> she was, felt hurt. So then that was the lineup, Vivian, Tessa, Ari, and me. <laughs> And what were you playing? And can you talk a little bit about your musical style? We were just learning. I was just learning the drums. And I, I, um, my style, what was my style? I didn't have enough rock and roll in me to know too much about rock and roll beat. My influences were really like, I grew up in Spain listening to equivalents of Bob Dylan like Juan Manuel Serrat, Paco Ibáñez. En la luna negra de los bandoleros cantan las espuelas. And there were people that were using this awesome poetry and putting it to music. So that was my main connection, more than to music, it was to the spoken word. And so, so then we start playing gigs. I, I acted a little bit like a manager at the beginning too. Like I remember calling the Roxy and that. And then um, Nora got more and more involved. And she was like Ari's mom, Nora. And uh, she had this clean house, which none of us had, you know. And so there was meals. She was very nice to us. And we were really um, mean to her. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, everybody would just like, oh, Nora, whatever, you know, like, you're just the grown-up. Give me some food. What is in your fridge? You know, type of thing. But she put up with all of it, like, very gracefully, I think. You said I bet it's only my future. What the fuck do you think you are? Changing buses or raising taxes. Changing things as you please. You want me. So then we had coming up with songs, so... I wrote quite a few of the songs at the beginning. Um, Number One Enemy was my first one. Shoplifting, New Town, where everybody goes around and sniffing Televisina and taking Clocaina. Like the straight world was saying, you're not good, you're taking drives, you're like in the streets and you look rough. I'm saying, well, you're taking different drugs, basically. Do you also say Futsbolina? Futbolina. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sniffing televisina and taking footballina or clocaina. They say clocaina, they say footballina. Sometimes the lyrics change, you know, but the way we did it was very democratic. I would write a lyric and then bring it to the band. Everybody would like um, say, well, I'll do this on the bass, I'll do this on the guitar, I'm going to sing it, you know, like get a melody together. And so I would think of something to do with the drums, but it was very a creative. And that was also something that was alive and real. In all the chaos and all the craziness, we wanted to be together. We were like sisters, you know, we wanted to be together. We were excited about the project. And we were rough and wild with each other, but we also like had a common focus. Watching you play, there's so much joy and energy. And it's just like you're having so much fun. (laughs) now and the old footage and it's and you're just doing so many creative things with it too you're hitting the rims and kind of like yeah like you said like painting or something yeah like uh, engaging the instrument like I think we relate engage who you are with love that person you know like be there be present and that was something that we had and so if 
in some of the gigs that we started doing, like, so we were having a fight, so we were engaging the fight. And the fight will happen right on stage, and people thought that we were putting it on. I always used the other band's drum set because it was better. Yeah, I had, you know, a drum, crummy drum set that I loved, and I painted and that, but it wasn't, like, the greatest drum set. So, so the first time I had to use my drum set, I didn't know that you had to secure the drum to the floor. So through the whole gig, I'm hitting the drum. The drum is running away from me. I'm grabbing the drum, bring it back in time to hit it again. Ari, she's like moving her arms and looking at me and saying, you are out of beat. And she's screaming. I mean, she's not singing. She's screaming. And I'm screaming at her. I'm trying to explain what's happening. <laughs> And then, like, she just keeps, like, lashing at me, and I'm lashing at her, and then I just whack my drumsticks at her, like, like, get out of here, like. So it was chaos, mayhem. But people thought that we, it was a put-on, like, many bands, you know, they were trying to be punkish, and we were just trying to deal with the situation, and she was driving me crazy. like something to be seen it was like something very different and the fact that we were girls I think it helped you know like we weren't trying to be girls we were girls we were a manufacturer a lot of the girls band you know they were told you know how they should sound the record companies had a lot of input what about the song shoplifting you wrote that about what <laughs> Well, <laughs> putting cheddar in the pocket, uh, paying your taxes. I think it was about paying taxes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was about like if you need something, you know, you go and put the cheddar in the pocket. <laughs> it was like how to do it. I'll talk to the cashier. He won't suspect. And if he does, do it, runner. <laughs> That's cool. I just was, I didn't realize that you wrote that song. And I was like, oh my God, that's my favorite. Yeah. So there was three songs I wrote at the beginning. So it's a little while down the road. I wrote FM and I was so excited when I wrote it. Because it was something that came out of how I really felt. And it said, FM frequent mutilation transmits over the air. Serving for the purpose of those who want you to feel like just feeling this oppression and so it's like a nod to that like dark side the dark side that I was feeling oh wait what is it frequent mutilation frequent mutilation transmits over the air serving for the purpose of those who want you to fear fast and nice suffocation in my mind <laughs> Waiting for another train to go by. <laughs> Frequent trains going by. How did you move from the slits to the raincoats? Or well, they me? moved me. I didn't move myself. Actually, did me a favor, but <laughs> why did they kick you out? What you started the band? Well, uh, I was clashing a lot, mainly with Vivian, and, and so I had different opinions, like we had eight managers while I was with them, and so Malcolm was one of them, for a, he wanted to be our manager, and so he invited us, and he was treating us, he took us out for a meal, I mean, people didn't, you know, we had no money, anything like that was like, wow, you know, even if we were playing all those things, you know, we lived and we were happy with it, but we were, had no means to things like that. <laughs> so anyway, he treated us and he took us somewhere and he said to us, um, I hate women and I hate music and I thrive in hate. And I'm like, guys, did you hear what he said? And I'm like, no, you know, like I really it made an impact. And because also I was at a point in my life that I'm questioning what I'm doing. So I wasn't just, everything is okay. We were having more and more fights. 
if someone says there's no ego, there, it w- there was a lot of ego. We were like at each other more. Not with Tessa. Tessa was my friend and she was cool. I mean, and with that, it was just like we were hitting each other's craft edges. So we, they wanted to go with Malcolm, but I managed to persuade them, I feel that's my recollection of it, to not do that. So we didn't go with Malcolm. And then there was talk about the cover, how they wanted to do the cover with the mad, all naked with the mad. And I, to me, it felt like that wasn't empowering. That was like a pin-up. That's how I saw it. And so I stuck to my story. Like, I didn't like it. So Vivian basically said, you know, Paul Mollet about me. And so they chose Vivian. You know, it was hurtful, and I felt very sad and rejected, and my, the slates were my whole life. So it was, like, really devastating, but in a way they did me a favor because I should have known, listened to myself, and thinking, this is not working, Paloma. But it's very hard to detach yourself from something. I have learned that the hard way many times, not that just one time. It's very hard to detach yourself from something that you have invested. It's your identity. It's like you're giving up yourself. So then, like, Richard had talked to the raincoats, you know, and said, you know, you should have palm olive. So I was still not sure what I was doing with my life. I was thinking that I had enough with the music business, in the music industry, and I just wanted to leave. I liked Gina, I knew Gina, she was a friend, and she was different, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll give it a try. Just I didn't get with the slits, you know, we didn't get along, and so maybe we could do something different. So I thought it would be so cool if we had a violin with all these, like, drums with the toms and, you know, just rough guitar and the lyrics. I was thinking like this melody in the midst of the chaos of the drum. And you did bring one of the songs that you wrote for the slits into the raincoats, Adventures Close to Home. Correct, yeah. How is the feeling of being in the raincoats different? than the slits. It was refreshing to be able to be heard. Like people really took time to listen to each other and to consider different options, which it had been like that at the beginning in the slits. But then it was like something in me was just done with the whole scene. And I, it was really hard for me to say that I didn't want to do it anymore. This time I was listening to myself because it was hard. They were my friends. And I knew that they were so excited that I was in the band, so I knew it would really be hard for them. But don't take it personal. <laughs> I follow, you know, my own fate. You know, I had to find my own answers. I had to go and fight other dragons somewhere else. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew I had to do it. So they said, well, before you go, can we do this LP? Which I'm really glad that we did, because they said, you know, something that we can look back to now. So you were only in the raincoats for six months? About that time, yeah. Wow. Did you ever miss the raincoats after you quit, after you left? Did I miss it? Yeah, did you ever miss it or miss being in a band? or? To be honest, I didn't. I was... <laughs> I'm sorry. No, sorry. That is not what I should say. No, I just felt like I, the same way I went into the punk, I went into my next step. You know, like I just tried to live like what is current right now in my life. And I'm not looking back to say, oh, I wish I had been there. In fact, like Ari came when she reformed the slits. She came to where I was and she spent three days in my house and we had a really good reconnection. I was excited to get back, you know, on a friends type of, and, and everything was past, you know, everything that had happened, it was fine, you know. But then I never heard from her after that. And so, so when she came to ask me if I wanted to be in the band, I didn't even have to think about it, to be honest. Were you in touch with her before she passed away? 
or did you know she was sick? No, I did not. I wish I had because actually I had gone through breast cancer myself. Um, everybody tr in good intentions tries to help you to tell you the latest alternative and how the evil pharmaceutical companies are trying to rip you off and blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm here today because I took the chemo and it's horrible. You feel like you're taking death. You're killing something in you, but like the doctor I had, she was a beautiful woman. Like she cared for me. I felt she cared for me, but I just wish I had had a conversation with her, but she was very private about it and I wasn't in touch. You know, like I say, I was open to being in touch with her, but she kind of the same way she came, she just disappeared. Like with the only one that I really kept in touch, it was Tessa from the Slits, and then from the Rankos I did, you know, through my sister Esperanza, but very sporadically because we live in such different lives. Which, it, it seems like that's so much a part of your personality, that you just go full on into everything, and it's great. <laughs> it's really amazing. It's just like... <laughs> it's all or nothing. <laughs> yeah. It has advantages and disadvantages. Sometimes it's good to stop and think. <laughs> I believe the challenge of punk. You could be yourself. I took it full hearted and then I realized, ah, I don't think people expect you to really be yourself. I think they expect you to mold and give this up and give this up, you know, like, and, and then that's when it becomes an institution. You know, the people that, they become the establishment. How has it felt to, like, just coming forward to reuniting a bit for the book release? And, and how do you feel about the book and that Jen Pelly wrote and how it kind of writes you guys into history? I think it's wonderful. I think she's a poet. And I, I just think I'm grateful that a young person will look at, want to find out. I think history is very important. You cannot learn and move into the future. I think you need to understand the past where women were at that time. We're not in the same place, I don't believe, but we still, there's a lot of things that, that are not equal, that should not be. We're equal, come on. <laughs> you know, like you, you, you have a dignity in being who you are. We're different and that's good. We need to be different, but there's a value and our contribution is very, unique. Even the birth of the two bands was very different to how the clash started. It was just different. I'm glad that we were there to do it different. It needed to be different. How does it feel to be getting back together to be doing the talks and the performances too? It's a blast. It's great because I feel like uh, through the years, I'm comfortable in my own skin. I am not, I understand that I still maybe have very different thoughts to other people, but I'm okay with other people thinking different. And I'm okay with having my own opinions and, and enjoying my own experiences, how I see the world. But so to go back, it's made me think like, it's just like it sparks something in my heart, my brain. I want to write. I want to write a book. I, it was amazing to be like with Gina and Anna again. Like I, I just loved that playing the drum. It was like a, like a high. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Palm Olive, thank you so much for sitting with me and just being who you are. Thank you, Alice. I enjoy talking to you. <laughs> I pray. Do I talk too much? <laughs> In the Band is produced by me, Allison Wolf, And me, Jonathan Shiflett. You can hear all of our episodes on Title On Air and follow us at I'm In The Band Podcast.